So that was a promo for our next series, starts next Sunday, called Letters from My Future Self. And uh, if you could write a letter back to your younger self and say, hey, maybe don't do that, do this, <laughs> some wise things that you could say. And then also, maybe you're in a situation right now and you're like, man, I would love to get on the other side of this and maybe, maybe get uh, a letter from my future self to tell me what to do right now. So there's a lot of practical wisdom in this series that we're going to look at. I think it's a great opportunity for you to invite a friend uh, starting next Sunday. And uh, also, we've got community group materials to go along with that series. So if you're a group leader, make sure that you stop and check out the books. You can do that at the table in the lobby uh, for the series. Starts next Sunday. Letters from my future self. My name is Luke Davidson, and I'm the campus pastor here at the North Richland Hills campus. Today, we're going to close out a series that we've been in for the last few weeks called This Changes Everything. And we've looked at several different topics that we really do believe have, ch have changed everything about who we are, our relationship with God, changing our world. And uh, if you've missed any of those messages, I want to encourage you to go back and make sure you listen to them over the last few weeks. Today, we're going to look at one final message that I really do believe changes everything. But we've kind of been looking through this concept of simply to say this, change starts with me. Change starts with me. And we've said this each week, so I'd love for you to just point at your heart. Let's say it one last time together. If you'll say these words, you ready? Here we go. Change starts with me. If we want to make a change, an impact, and a difference in this world, change your mind, change your heart, change your actions, the way that you think. And I think you'll start to see things change around you. And changing inside begins to multiply itself into individuals and into your community. And uh, I, I wonder, however, though, maybe throughout this series, as we keep saying, this changes everything, this changes everything, have you wondered if that's a little too optimistic? Like, maybe there's some things that just don't change, right? That's never, that's never going to change. And I, I wrote a few down. Like, I know for me, one thing I've come to grips with after 10 years of marriage is that my wife is not going to stop buying new decorative pillows. <laughs> it just happens every few weeks, every few months. There's new pillows in the house. I don't, I don't get frustrated about it. It's not going to change, right? Nothing, some things never change. Cowboys fans, I've been down here long enough, five years. I know Cowboys fans will never root for the Eagles, right? <laughs> not going to change. Not going to happen. Donald Trump's hair, unfortunately, not, ch not changing. <laughs> not changing. And I also know this. Talking about Texas A&M without the fans whooping is never going to change. Yes, see, there was. I didn't even get done saying the phrase. It's just a, a compulsive reaction right there. So some things never change. We say, I don't know we were just having some fun with that. But man, aren't there sometimes some instances where in your life we just really start to give up hope on things, on things changing. Maybe you have felt like I am never, I'm never going to get my husband to come to church with me. It's never going to change. Maybe you've looked at your husband or your wife before and just said, you know, honestly, I don't feel like we're ever going to get pregnant. I'm really discouraged. Things will never change. We'll never get out of debt. If you're a young professional coming out of school, school and you've got tons of student loans, and you feel like, we're never going to get out of debt. My girlfriend's never for going to forgive me for what I did. My sister's cancer is not going away. My uncle is not going to stop drinking. We have certain instances and things in our life where you look at them and say, this is, I don't feel like it's ever going to change. Here's the crazy thing, that for me, in my role, in my perspective, as I get to see the life of our church and get to hear from so many different people, I want to encourage you and tell you, those things are the kind of things that happen and the things that change every single week at Compass. It is not uncommon for an individual or for a couple to go through Financial Peace University and to get some financial training and they implement a plan and depending on the size of their debt over a few months or, or a few years, they come out and they pay off their debt. They're debt free. It's incredible to watch it happen. Every once in a while, we'll have a special Sunday, and you're like, okay, Luke told me to invite them, so I'll invite them, but they're never going to come. But then you invite them, and they say, okay. And you're like, what? Okay, I guess you're coming to church with me now. And then everything kind of changes, because you don't care if you like it. You're like, do they like it? Was it too loud? Are there enough donuts? You know, did, did they have a parking spot? All these things. And it, just, it starts to change, and maybe they even come back, and they loved, they loved being here. Every once in a while, I get to see somebody ask God to heal them. They pray for healing, and sometimes God heals, heals them instantly. It's so incredible to witness. Or you'll see somebody that decides to make the decision to follow Jesus, and they say, I want to follow him, and, and I'm, I, they, they follow that decision by being baptized. And every once in a while, I get to see a glimpse, somebody that had an addiction or a huge sin struggle or stronghold in their life, God just takes it away. I don't know why. It doesn't always happen, but, but I get to see those things that start to change what you think was possible. And I believe that's because those are moments where Jesus changes everything. Jesus changes everything. 
you get to a point, if you become aware and you just pay attention to what God is doing, you get to a point where you start to believe that the impossible can happen. And, and I'm not talking about impossible like Tom Cruise jumping out of an airplane in Mission Impossible style. I'm talking about real people, real life situations where Jesus changes everything, happens every single day. I think that's because Jesus makes the impossible possible. If you have your Bibles, you can open up with me to Mark chapter 5 or follow along on the screen. We're going to look at a day in Jesus' life where he changed everything. Like we get to the end of chapter 5, and this is what it says. It says, the people, the crowd, they were overwhelmed and totally amazed by what they had seen from Jesus. What were they amazed by? Not just one thing, but three things that Jesus did that day. So let's go back to the early morning. We'll start uh, in verse 2. Jesus has gone to a region called the region of the Gerasenes. The region of the Gerasenes, I've been told, is a wild place at that time. Maybe sort of like what happens in the region of the Gerasenes stays in the region of the Gerasenes. And uh, what we know is that Jesus traveled there by boat, which is a story in and of itself. I'll just give you the quick cliff notes of it. They had been in a massive storm on their way. Like to the point where Jesus' disciples, some of whom were fishermen who had spent a lot of time on, on the water in a boat, and, and I'm sure had been in storms before, but they were terrified. They thought, this time, I don't think we're going to make it out. I think we're going to drown. And yet at a certain point, Jesus just stood up, commanded the storm to stop, silent, be still. And everything was quiet and calm. And just like that, the disciples are like, who is this guy? that even the wind and the waves obey him. So that had just happened. It was about to get even better. We read in verse two that Jesus lands at the region of the Gerasenes. He climbed out of the boat and a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from a cemetery to meet him. This is dawn of the dead, apparently. <laughs> the man lived among the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with a chain. This guy, this is spooky. This is messed up. Some of you are like, I don't, I don't think this is real. This is true. Uh, but the disciples are saying, this happened. This guy was running at us. It scared us to death. He comes straight at us. And uh, we're thinking, are we okay? Verse 6 kind of recaps that. Again, let's look at verse 6. It says, when Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, and bowed low before Jesus. With a shriek, he screamed. I went and looked up the word shriek. In Greek, it means the croak of a raven. Imagine that coming out of a human. That would just, ooh, it would stir you up. With a shriek, the man screamed, why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already said to the spirit, come out of this man, you evil spirit. Several details to notice here. This man runs to Jesus, said he ran to meet him. Didn't walk if I'm a disciple, I'm like, oh my goodness, here comes, here comes the demon-possessed dude straight out of the cemetery. What is going on? Why is he running at us? I'll tell you why. I think it was because of Jesus' authority. A couple other details here. Verse 7 says, why are you interfering with me? He says to Jesus, why are you interfering with me? Other translations say, what business do you have with me, Jesus? What do you want with me? And then you go back to verse 6. It says that he bowed down. He, he kneels before him down and he is... This is a posture of submission. This isn't a posture of worship. This is a posture of submission. He runs, he summons him. Jesus is summoning this guy. What business do you have with me? I've come, I've run to you. Please be gentle is his posture here. What this demon knows is that Jesus has superior power over him. In fact, this demon knows who he is, calls him son of the most high God. And this superior power is what's going to change everything for the guy who's being imprisoned spiritually in his own body by these demons. It gets even spookier in verse 9. Jesus commands the spirit to identify himself. What is your name? And the demon replied, my name is Legion, because there are many of us inside this man. What is a legion? A legion was a Roman military battalion that was well over 6,000 soldiers and so this demon identifies himself and says, not just one, there are many of us. And you do the math here, I mean, this is kind of intense. If you had a Roman legion of soldiers coming against one person, it's going to be no contest. I don't care if you're Luke Skywalker coming, holding up against Kylo Ren and his forces. It's just not, you're not going to make it through. Except the exact opposite is true here. This was no contest for Jesus. And you're going to see that play out here in just a moment. 
I hope that you can apply this to your own life and be aware that if there is something that has taken control of your finances or your life or it's wrecking your marriage or your relationship with your kids, there's something that you feel like you've lost control of, just like this guy had lost control of his life. I know that specifically he had a demonic presence that was oppressing him, but he lost control. And maybe there's things in your life you feel like, I can't, I can't do it. I can't get there. I've lost control of it. I want you to know Jesus has authority over that thing. It has to submit to his authority. And when you understand that, I think it can start to change things. These demons know what Jesus can do. And they know that he is about to expel them. And so they beg and plead for him to be gentle. It says in verse 11 and 12, there happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirits begged. Let us enter into them. So they're begging and pleading, please let us do this. It goes on in verse 13. So Jesus gave him permission. I allow you to go and do this. It's like granting military leave to them. You're you're dismissed. Don't let the door hit you on your way out. And the evil spirits came out of the man, entered the pigs, and the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water because despite what they say, pigs can't fly. (laughs) Wow. They also can't swim either because they drown. And so Jesus took care of the demons. The guy is no longer possessed. How does this affect the community? Verse 14, the herdsmen who'd been watching the pigs, those, that, that was their herd, they fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. Are these people excited? How do you see them? Are they excited? They rushed out to see what happened. A crowd soon gathered around Jesus and they saw the man who'd been possessed by a legion of demons. He was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane and and everything was great and they celebrated and happily ever after, right? Actually wrong. It says at the end of that verse, and they were all afraid. They were terrified at what had just happened. Verse 16 goes on and says, then... Then those who had seen what happened told the others about the demon-possessed man and the pigs, and the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and to leave him alone. The crowd is not comfortable. They want Jesus to get out of here. Why? I think there might be several reasons. They're not explicitly laid out, but I think we can kind of connect the dots here. First off, this was weird. (laughs) It was supernatural. It was freaky. This was not, not normal. I think it made him uncomfortable. I think it made him a little nervous. And maybe they just want life to go back to to normal. Plus, Jesus has just destroyed their industry for the next decade, pig farming. Those those, uh, herdsmen were watching those pigs. That was was their livelihood. 2,000 pigs. That's a lot of dough. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of pork. And they're not so happy about not getting to eat pork anymore. Now they got got to settle for for turkey bacon. It's not the same thing. No more, no more bacon mac and cheese. No more bacon wrapped chicken jalapeno poppers. No more BLTs. No more swine apple. Have you heard of swine apple? Look at that right there. It sounds really good. It's a bacon wrapped pineapple stuffed with pork ribs. Sounds good. I think it looks disgusting, but, but man, no more of this stuff. They can't have it. Thanks to Jesus, all the pigs are drowned and the people are not happy. Interesting application maybe for us to just think about is how do we react when Jesus changes things? Sometimes we cry out and say, God, would you just change it? Would you do something in my marriage, with my kids, with my job, with my health? But do you really want him to? Or if he did, would it just weird you out? And then you'd ask him to stop. Hey, Jesus, would you just cut it out on second thought? Just just leave me alone. And that's what the community and Jesus' story said, they said, would, Jesus, would you just leave? Would you cut it out? You're, you're scaring the children, Jesus. Stop it. And I wonder if also maybe it has to do with whether it happens to you or to someone else. Maybe if you're so desperate and you're, you're really wanting something to change and it, and it does change, you're so thankful and you just want to tell people about it and you're excited. But sometimes, have you ever had this? I, I have to confess, I've had this happen to me before where somebody else tells me something miraculous happened and they were healed or God took care of their financial situation or, or something saved their business or he heard, they heard from God. And you look at them and you think, yeah, that's nice. You're crazy. Would you just go and take your crazy somewhere else and just leave me alone right now? 
and I think what I've also noticed in this story, I think this is a difficult thing that we maybe need to grapple with, and maybe you've felt this before, but notice this community in this story, they cared more about their industry than they cared about this man. And here's a tough truth. There are some people that would rather keep you chained up than suffer a personal loss. They would never say that to you, but they've thought it. We've all thought it. Sure, we want to navigate people to God and I want everyone to follow Jesus. Unless I have to sit next to them at church, can we just avoid that part? Or unless their kid is going to be in youth group with my kid, I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. Have you ever thought that or felt that way? I want to be in a community group unless, unless somebody in my group is going to need me to help them or drive them somewhere. I, I don't want to, that's, that's a little too much, right? I, I don't want to have to deal with that stuff. Some communities, I don't think this is us, by the way, but I would really love to steer us away from this, but he, I think some communities put business before people, put your preferences before people, put your own comfort before people. And I just want to say clearly, not Jesus. Jesus cared more about this man and setting him free. And I, and I think he cared even more about freeing that entire community from a massively evil demonic presence. That was his priority. But the community asks him to leave, and so he does. As he and his disciples are leaving, that formerly demon-possessed man is saying, hey, I want to go with you. And you got to think about his context. This guy had been totally isolated from his community, for I don't know how long. They had been scared of him. They had driven him out of their town and he had been living in horrible conditions, nakedness out among burial caves. He doesn't really have the courage and the comfortability to say, now I'm gonna go back and live with those people again. Not to mention the fact, I wonder if they would blame him indirectly for the rest of his life. He would be the guy who's like, yeah, because you were healed, all of our pigs died and I lost all my money and all my investments because of you. He's like, I think, I'd rather just avoid all that. <laughs> Jesus, can I just go with you? Can I, can I follow you? Jesus says, no. Verses 19 and 20, Jesus said, no, you go home to your family. Tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. So the man started off to visit the 10 towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things that Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at, why, at what he told them. You know why they were amazed? Because previously, I, I wonder if the word had spread around about Legion, he's out in the burial caves, don't go down that road or you might run, in, run into Legion. And then he's coming to your town and you're thinking, Legion's coming, hide your wife, hide your kids, hide everybody. Legion's coming for us. And then you see that he's dressed and I, maybe, he's, maybe he's groomed and he's in his right mind and he tells you what Jesus did. People were just amazed. Jesus had changed everything. Jesus changed everything. That region was never the same from that day forward. This is just one of very, very many examples of how Jesus changed everything. You can look back at history and see that Jesus has changed everything and his influence and his impact, almost every culture and society on the globe has been impacted by Jesus, his actions, and his teachings. Even if you don't believe half of it, it doesn't matter. His impact and his effect has been almost universal. He, he, he changed the weather. We already talked about that, right? That's, inf, inf, that's pretty influential, right? Maybe you don't believe that. But here's several things that I don't think you can argue with. Jesus changed time. He changed the calendar. Our calendars count down to stop and then restart based off of Jesus' life. It is the year 2018 because they based the calendar off of Jesus' life. That's, that's pretty impressive, Jesus also changed culture. A lot of the things that we do and that we say and that we expect, the way that we expect people to act, you just take it for granted. But Jesus was the one who introduced those concepts. He changed our culture. He changed fashion. Jesus was wearing a beard and sandals long before we were. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny if Jesus had Instagram stories to swipe up to buy these sandals or something? <laughs> I don't know. But seriously, Jesus changed things and his, his effect, his influence on pop culture. There's things that you say or that you've heard other people say. Did you know that Jesus said them? You ever heard somebody say, salt of the earth, light of the world, turn the other cheek, judge not lest you be judged, love your neighbor as yourself, don't build your house on the sand, build your house on the rock, do to others what you would have them do to you. Have you ever heard somebody call someone a wolf in sheep's clothing? or called a whitewashed tomb. 
Have you ever been advised to be as shrewd as a snake or innocent as a dove? Jesus said all of those things. It came from him. And that's just a taste. I, I think to this day, almost every culture has been influenced and affected by Jesus' teachings. Jesus changed religion. Jesus was Jewish. His followers were Jewish. And because of his influence, these Jewish followers of a 3,000-year-old of a religion changed their day of worship of a 3,000-year-old religion from Saturday to Sunday. And then they stopped circumcising their baby boys, which was Jewish law, something they'd done for thousands of years. And then they stopped observing the dietary restrictions of the Jewish law, which is something they had done for thousands of years. They just changed it because of him. They started eating pork and stuff. What a, what a, beautiful, <laughs> what a beautiful blessing for them, right? <laughs> Jesus disrupted religious structures across the globe. He changed things and influenced things globally. Islam, totally influenced by Jesus. Wouldn't be what it is without him. You just go look throughout the Quran. Jesus is everywhere in the Quran. Just saying. Jesus changed things. Jesus changed the status of women. The ancient world, primarily the dominant societies, women didn't really have hardly any say. No writing vote, no, no votes, no rights to vote. Uh, no say. They couldn't be uh, used as a witness in the court of law. Nobody trusted them. They were seen as property, second-class citizens. Jesus comes along. He's got women disciples. And they are the key eyewitnesses in the story that he, was die that he died, he was killed, buried, and then came back to life. I think Jesus deserves a lot of credit for changing the status of women. Maybe the most impressive to me is that Jesus changed the Roman Empire, which, in my opinion, the most powerful ancient empire Rome became a Christian nation. Do you understand how crazy that is? That would be like the Middle East today all becoming Jewish. <laughs> Just like that. It's impossible. You say, that's never going to happen. That would be like Donald Trump deleting his Twitter account. You say, it's never going to happen. It's not going to happen. Or being able to get Chick-fil-A on a Sunday, which I desperately, every day, every Sunday, I crave Chick-fil-A. It's right there. Be like PETA wearing fur coats. Not going to happen. Or even more unlikely, Sooner fans wearing burnt orange. You say it's never going to happen. <laughs> you think of the most impossible things. I'm telling you, still more likely than Rome becoming a Christian nation. To them, Jesus was just a cult leader, one of many of these. They, they called themselves messiahs, and they would just hear about him, execute him, wipe out the movement, move on to the next one. And Jesus was just one of many cult leaders that rose up out of Israel, which to them, I know sometimes, maybe you don't feel this way, but every once in a while you feel like, oh, Israel is so prestigious, we hold it in high esteem. The Romans did not hold Israel in high esteem. It was a thorn in their side. It was constantly full of problems, people bickering and fighting and starting revolutions there all the time. It was frustrating to them. And then this guy that they killed, all these followers start spreading like crazy. They can't control it. They spend the next few centuries arresting hundreds, thousands, even millions of Christians, executing them, burning them on crosses, killing them in gladiator games, all that stuff. They're trying to stop it for centuries. Not to mention the fact that every major city in the Roman Empire had a temple dedicated to pagan worship. And there was a lot of money that exchanged hands because of those temples. <laughs> Selling of idols, temple activities, which there's a full gauntlet of those things. A lot of money, a lot of economics involved. Like we know that sometimes when apostles, uh, followers of Jesus would go and tell people about Jesus in some of those cities, people that worked with the temple economic culture would would chase them out of town and try to beat them up and kill them to keep them from messing with the temple economics. There's a lot of money that exchanged hands because of this. You're telling me this whole culture, this entire empire is going to become Christian? They're going to drop all that stuff in order to follow Jesus? No way. Except that's exactly what happened. 313 AD, Emperor Constantine became a Christian, issued an edict saying that he had accepted Christianity. Ten years later, official religion of the Roman Empire. Jesus changed everything. I cannot tell you how much that has changed the entire Western Hemisphere. Everything. Our entire world has been affected by a guy who only walked the planet for 33 years. It's pretty impressive. But not only that, Jesus is still changing everything. We were looking earlier at the story of the demon-possessed man and how Jesus set him free, healed him, I guess by breakfast time. The day was just getting started for him. And so Jesus and his disciples left that region, went back across the lake to a little town called Capernaum. They get off the boat. It's a similar scene. A crowd begins to gather around him. They're excited that he's there. In the crowd 
interestingly enough, is a very influential and powerful man from that town. He was the religious leader of their local synagogue. He's got a lot of influence in their community. And he walks up to Jesus, he bows down before him, and he asks Jesus for help because his little girl was dying. And he believes that only Jesus can help her. It's interesting for us to notice because Jesus and the religious leaders didn't really get along very often. The religious leaders were often trying to plot a way to stop him and eventually they figured out a way to execute him. But that day, Jairus, that religious leader, humbled himself and comes to Jesus and says, will you come to my house? Will you, will you lay hands on my daughter and pray for her? And will you heal my baby girl? Jairus knew that Jesus could change everything for him, for his family. And so Jesus says, of course I will. And he follows, he says, take me to your house. And they start to walk and the crowd is following with him. While they're walking along, something interesting happens in verse 25. There was a woman in the crowd who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. I've been told that this indicates like bleeding from her reproductive organs. Just saying that's something that would have been incredibly embarrassing for social interactions and just how this had affected everything, how this had affected her ability to maybe be married and have a family. All of those things may have been eliminated because of her condition. For 12 years, she had suffered a great deal from many doctors. Over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay them, but she'd gotten no better. In fact, she had only gotten worse. If you're a doctor or a nurse and you know these things way better than me and you think some of the ancient practical things that they tried to do to repair this probably caused a lot more damage for her. This has been miserable condition for 12 years. Not only that, but she's totally broke. She spent everything that she's had trying to fix this condition and she's about to give up. She's about to give up. But then she heard that Jesus was in town and she heard that she heard about Jesus. Verse 27 says, she came up behind him through the crowd, reached out and touched his robe. She thought to herself, if I, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. And immediately the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. She reaches out, grabs the robe, he passes by, instantly she is healed. And Jesus felt this power go out from him. So he turns around, exchanges with the crowd for a moment, finds her, has a quick conversation, realizes what has happened, and then he tells her, your faith has made you well. Imagine how that changed everything for her. Now she doesn't have to leave the dinner party early because of bleeding. Maybe now she has an opportunity to start a family. I don't know. This changed everything for her life from that day forward. She's healed. And maybe you think everything is great now and tidy and perfect and they lived happily ever after and Jesus changed the community. Wrong again. Just like the last story, something very unfortunate happened because while this whole exchange was happening and this woman was being healed, Jairus' daughter, that, that religious leader, his daughter had died. Some of the messengers came from Jairus' house and they said to Jairus, say, listen, it's too late. Don't worry bothering Jesus with this. Your daughter has died. Jesus is standing there and he's like, Hello, I'm standing right here. <laughs> Have you, did you forget that I, I changed the weather pattern last night and I rerouted 6,000 demons this morning and we literally just healed a woman? Like it just happened. I'm, I, I can hear you. I got this. Just believe, he says in verse 36. Don't be afraid. Just have faith. Take me to your house. And so they continue walking to the house. They push through, Jesus pushes through the commotion and the tears and the crowd and he finds the little girl, sends everybody out of the room, grabs her hand and then he speaks these words to her, such powerful words, the command and the authority of Jesus as he says in verse 41, he says, little girl, get up. And the little girl who was 12 years old, interesting those numbers right there that correlate with the other woman, immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. I don't know if there's any connection here, but here we have a woman who for 12 years had been bleeding, and then we have a little girl who's 12 years old. Jesus has changed everything for both of them. I don't understand all the complexities of that, but that is beautiful to see how Jesus does this. I wonder if you hear these stories and you think, that's nice. You're crazy. 
You just take that crazy somewhere else. Would you just leave me alone? This is weird. I don't want to deal with that stuff. How do you react when Jesus changes things? How do you react? Because these kinds of miracles are still happening every single day. We trust Jesus for healing. We trust him for miracles. We believe that Jesus is changing things right now. I believe that someone here today, you will come and pray with us after the service, after the sermon. You'll come and pray with our prayer team. You will ask Jesus to make a change, to heal you, and someone, he might do it today. I'm believing alongside of you, and I can't wait to hear about it. We believe that. But even if he doesn't do it today, Don't you be discouraged. Don't stop trusting. You keep believing. Because one day, Jesus will change everything. He has changed everything. He is changing things. And one day, he will change everything. The tough thing that we know is that even those that are are healed today, you might get sick again in the future. If a sickness is healed today, you might get another one in the future. If you're, if you're resurrected from the dead today, you're, you're gonna die later. <laughs> like, yeah. Jairus, his daughter in the story, we don't read that his daughter lived forever. Lazarus, who Jesus raised from the dead, we don't read that he le- lived forever. Those people, they went on and died later on. But one day, I'm telling you, that's all going to change. Jesus is going to return from heaven. He's going to re- renovate all of creation, including you and me. And he's going to raise up the dead. He's going to transform our physical bodies into new bodies that have no sickness, no cancer, no aching joints, no sagging skin. <laughs> It'll all be changed and fixed. We read about this in a lot of places in the New Testament, but one that's very eye-opening is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This was written by a guy named Paul, who was an early church. Uh, he, he started different churches in different cities and, and wrote letters to encourage them and to teach them about what was gonna happen. He said, there's an order to this resurrection, this, uh, this renewal, this renovation of, of even our physical bodies. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. That Jesus, they, they said, that he, he, it has happened. Jesus was the first one to rise up and he's not gonna die anymore. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. After that, the end will come when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power, for Christ must reign until he humbles all of his enemies beneath his feet. That's what he's doing right now. He's in heaven, he's king, and creation is transforming. It is changing. Everything is submitting to his authority and to his will and to his power. Verse 29, or 26, says the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For the scriptures say God has put all things under his authority. Now when this finishes, he will return. And in Revelation chapter 21 verse four and seven. And you can read above there just all these beautiful descriptions of this new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem, they call it, and all these beautiful things, a, a bridegroom and his bride and, and this union coming together. And then it says at the third line from the bottom, when this happens, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. They're gone forever. The next, the next verse says, and the one sitting on the throne, Jesus said, look, I am making everything new. I'm changing everything. And then he said to me, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all of these blessings and I will be their God and they will be my children. Jesus is changing everything and he will change everything, you and me included. And if we learn anything from the stories that we looked at today, the story of a demon-possessed man who was afflicted and had lost control of his life, the story of a sick woman who was desperate and broke and searching for her last hope, the story of an influential, powerful man who didn't have the ability to save his own daughter from dying. What do they do? They ran to Jesus, they fell at his feet, they reached out to him, they listened to what he said. And Jesus changed everything. 